So assuming that um, the next administration in the United States, the next president, and all leaders around the country say, okay, we're 100% in, we'll do whatever it takes, and you guys are in charge, and you have everyone will follow your exact instructions, um, and we'll do any solutions you propose to solve the environment, the water, the deforestation, the biodiversity, the ocean acidification, the coral reefs, the wildfires, you know, they'll do whatever it takes. Richard Oppenlander was here the other day, and he said, absolutely, no matter what, 100% give up eating animal products immediately because to raise them and to grow the feed for them is contributing. So that was his idea, and it seemed very, seemed very good. It seemed excellent. What are your suggestions? You're now in charge of the planet. You have full control, and your go job is to stop this climate change and all these other problems. Assuming we'll all go along with whatever you say and we'll fund it, what should we do? Okay, shall I start with that one then? <laughs> so I, I would actually start with something quite simple. Because I actually think that sometimes, uh, and there's this wonderful book called Nudge, whereby you can just nudge people. So the first thing I do as world dictator, uh, thank you, Steve, uh, for my election, uh, is then make subsidized fossil fuels illegal. So I would strip out globally all fossil fuel subsidies. Now that comes to about, according to the IMF, uh, that well-known left-wing think tank, um, that it's about $5 trillion per year is spent by different uh, countries subsidizing their fossil fuels. So if I did that, I would just strip that out. And the first thing that will happen is fossil fuels then become much more expensive. Actually, then renewables become more competitive, and actually, you're going to buy your electricity from renewable sources than fossil fuels. So that's the first very simple little tweak you can do that then starts to use the global capitalist system to actually drive things in the right direction. Now, I'm, that's my starting gambit. Who, who else is going to help? <laughs> I'll jump in, Mark. <laughs> um, again, I'm, I'm sort of a one-trick pony. I only talk about water. Um, but, um, you know, a couple of observations of where, we, of where governments and communities have tried to make change with respect to water. Um, a, a couple of principles that I think have, have proven to be very, very important. One is that the transition has to be humane, um, that it can't be draconian, um, that it can't be harmful, that you can't um, have undue effect on certain sectors of society or on certain people's livelihoods. Um, somebody who is raising alfalfa to feed cattle um, is going to have to make a transition if you go to, you know, to a no-meat diet. So, and that involves time. The, the biggest important part about that humane transition is the time it takes. People will do remarkable things if they're given enough time to do it. Um, when Nelson Mandela came into power in, in South Africa, uh, you know, he, he realized that he had to change the mindset around how terrible things were in the immediate present or even in the immediate future. And so he started talking about future building. He started talking about time horizons in which people could imagine change could take place and that they could be and they could accommodate the change. And it was very, very transformational. And so I think one part of it is, is the transition. Another is that um, most humans um, don't react very well to being told what to do, um, to regulatory um, impositions. Uh, they respond much better to incentives. So you have to figure out how to do, can you incentivize people to take, to, to, to behave differently, to consume differently? Uh, what kind of incentives might those be? Um, but I think ultimately my answer would be that it's, that it's a little bit of a blend of both the regulatory approach and the incentive approach. And the most important regulatory approach in water is to put a lid or a cap on the volume of water that can be taken out of any water source, out of any river, out of any groundwater aquifer, out of any lake. We need to leave enough water in there flowing through those systems so that they protect the natural world, they protect the ecological systems that we all depend upon, as Mark and Guy have asserted. Um, but there needs to be a limit put on how much you can take out of there. 
Now, the fascinating thing about, that we've witnessed about places around the world where they have put a cap on how much water can be removed from a particular water source is that it becomes a monstrously powerful driver for efficiency and conservation. And so people learn how to adapt. If they're, you know, if, if they're, if they're facing a constraint, if they know there's no more frontier out there, if there's no more horizon, no more abundance of water, we're out of the age of surplus, if they know that there's a fixed limit to how much they're going to be able to take, um, they will find ways to adjust. And so it becomes a massive driver for the right kinds of behaviors. Um, and part of that incentive also is once you have put a lid on how much can be taken, there still may be plenty of water available for everybody, but they have to be able to share it, and they have to be incentivized to share it. So in any one system of water use, any community that's using a particular aquifer, a particular river, there might be the opportunity to do many, much, much more with that available water if people could, when they, when they had, felt like they had a surplus, they could somehow share it with, with somebody and be compensated for that. And so we get into some issues about water trading and water markets and systems of governance that allow for water to move among different sectors of water use, different individuals using water. And if we can become both a water conserving and a water sharing society, I think we can overcome a lot of the problems that we're facing with water crises in the world. Those, those seem all to be excellent practical suggestions, but um, there, there's another issue and um, so if, if you go for example as an example to the, to the area of cancer President Nixon more than 40 years ago declared war against cancer the war has not been won it seems from the statistics that cancer is increasing not decreasing and you might ask well why is that and uh, I think one of the reasons is that we really don't understand the the real basis of cancer and how it occurs and why it occurs a lot of things are known but and we know a lot about genomics and, uh, and such, but, but uh, there, there's no ag agreed upon um, uh, molecular mechanism for what's going on in cancer. And you know, possibly if we really understand it, then we'll be able to do something about it that's, that's seriously effective. So like the, the area of, of cancer, the area of other areas of science, in some cases we don't even know what we don't know. And, in the case of climate, I think it's the same. I had the pleasure, I, I, at one time I was an advisor to the National Science Board, which, which um, governs the National Science Foundation. And I sat meeting uh, with all these people, and one, one person I met, his, his field was um, uh, uh, climate, uh, weather, and such. And I asked him about the physics of understanding of what's going on. This was about eight or nine years ago. And he said, well, there's nobody studying it anymore. Uh, he said, people are, are now resorting to climate models. Essentially, all the questions, which I, a few of which I mentioned before, uh, people are not addressing. So we don't, we don't understand climate, really. We don't understand why, why in Seattle in the wintertime and in London in, in the wintertime, you can expect a lot of gray, gray clouds and moisture, and in other periods of time, it's, it's dry and, and sunny, except on, on, on some occasions. So if we want to do something about climate, the solutions suggested by my colleagues are practical and reasonable and, and sound certainly interesting. But if we could understand the nature of climate, which we don't understand, it might be possible that we could actually do something about it in a way that nobody has ever expected. And so, so if, I, um, if I were the president uh, running against our two candidates, um, um, I would lose resoundingly if I won. Uh, I would, there would be uh, one aspect that I, I would be eager to fund, would be a, a fundamental basic understanding of what's climate all about. I think it's critically important to do that. And, and we don't know, but it might be that if we really understood it, we could come up with practical solutions in a different, a completely different, different realm of perhaps science and technology. There are a lot of things we don't know, obviously, and that we will never know. But I think that most people in this room would agree what lies at the root of our myriad predicaments. We know what washes the soil into the ocean at an accelerating rate. 
We know what fouls the air and dirties the water. We know that, that the heat engine, that is civilization, is rooted in civilization. We know that all these predicaments are rooted in industrial civilization. Vote for me, I'll bring it down. It's not a popular outlook. But civilization lies at the, at the root of each of these predicaments, including monetary disparity, endemic racism, endemic misogynism, the list goes on and on. Most of us would prefer civilization to no civilization. And small wonder, we all benefit greatly from the privileges rooted in this set of living arrangements. But the 150 to 200 species we drove to extinction today don't benefit from civilization. I speak on behalf of those who can't speak for themselves. So, Guy, can, can I ask you, because I, I, I really do like uh, your approach, how do we move to a post-industrial society? I mean, so, I mean, I work with a lot of social scientists who look at how society is working and how it doesn't work, and there is all this sort of uh, discussion about postmodernism uh, moving into the post-industrial society. Do you see any chance that we can move beyond this sort of civilization into a civilization that isn't reliant on the sort of the industrial uh, sort of basis? I mean, can we move forward? Do you think? Not a civilization, but societies are already uncivilized or pre-civilized societies that we haven't made contact with yet, so we haven't destroyed them. The goal is to destroy them. That's one goal of civilization: is to destroy, to incorporate, to absorb every person on the planet. But we haven't done that yet. In the first 2.8 million years of the human experience, the first essentially 195,000 years of our species Homo sapiens was spent in pre-civilized or uncivilized societies. There are models. They don't involve 7.4 billion people. Yeah, and that's a key point, I, I think, Guy, is, is you know, there is an issue as to what kind of changes are available to us given the population load that we've got now. So you remind me of uh, a good friend of mine, Kent Redford, um, who uh, when he was doing his, his doctoral research, he was doing it in the Amazon, and he really wanted to go study you know, some of these um, tribes that had had very little contact. He really wanted to understand. Um, he was you know, essentially a forest ecologist. Uh, well, I would say more of a ecosystem ecologist. He really wanted to understand how these people interacted with their ecosystems that made them sustainable. Um, and and he, he came away, his, his, so his doctoral hypothesis of this sort of sustainable community interacting, you know, in a, in a way that was respectful of, of um, you know, the availability of resources and never over, overusing the resources, he, his, his findings were very contrary to that. And that, in fact, he wrote a paper that was a very seminal paper uh, the Empty Forest, which was about the fact that basically the way that these societies were operating is that they would completely deplete the resources in one place, and then, but they had a huge Amazonian forest to keep moving around in. And so it was sort of like patch after patch after patch of consumption and alteration of the forest, but they had enough room to move in. So I think, yes, there are s true sustainable use models, I think there, but, but I don't know that, you know, all of the um, sort of aboriginal indigenous societies necessarily behaved in that way. But the thing that I fear is whether or not we can move to any sort of sustainable alternative post-industrial society, given that we've got, what, 7.4 now, billion mm -hmm. people on the planet. Yeah, and one of the predicaments, of course, is human population overshoot. There's 207,000 people on the planet today that weren't here yesterday. The longer we keep civilization going, the more people we get every day. That's not going to go anywhere good. I think this is why, I mean, I, I've been very fortunate in my career that I've worked with artists, uh, theater producers, musicians, looking at different ways to actually communicate with uh, the public. Because one of the things I think that our scientists fail to do is we can really good at problems, okay? We can tell you problems until the cows come home, okay? We are really good at that. What we don't have is the ability to envisage a future 
that we can aim to move to. So when I ask Guy, what is a post-industrial society look like? It's not because I'm trying to put him on the spot at all. I would love to know what that looked like because I want to know how can we have a society of 10 billion people by the middle of the century in a sustainable way? Now, again, what we need to do is actually engage with the creatives in our society to actually provide a vision because people have a drive. When they see a vision of something the future could look like, they will happily work towards that. You can see this with uh, young people coming into university. When they see that there's a vision of what they want to actually achieve in life, they'll actually work for it. And I think that's something that our scientists fail to do. Okay? We fail to provide a final vision of, look, the world can be a much better place. This is what it looks like. And I think what is really upsetting is that at the moment, politicians all around the world seem to be stuck in this sort of like fear and threatening mode, whereas politicians used to be able to say, look, if you give me the chance, I'm going to try and make the place better. I'm going to try to actually... And I think that's what we need to get back to. Why have we not got the leaders and actually the artists who are providing a, a future vision that could be a lot more positive? 